a lot of unspoken expectations have caused a lot of damage to relationships. And one of the things that when I um, start speaking with a couple who has expressed an interest in the marriage, one of the things we spend a lot of time talking about is expectations, particularly unspoken expectations. Because we all go into a relationship with expectations that sometimes we don't clearly make obvious. For example, I grew up in a home where when dinner was served, it included two or three vegetables, a meat, and a piece of bread, and sweet tea. That was on the table almost every night in my home. Now, my mom didn't work, so it kind of helped. But that was my expectate. That is all I ever knew for dinner. My wife, on the other hand, um, was raised by a single dad who thought that every meal ought to have red meat at the table. So by the time I met her when she was a teenager, she was already a vegetarian. Not because she, you know, was, there was some reason to be vegetarian other than she had just eaten enough red meat in her lifetime to not want to eat anymore ever again. I broke her of that, so we're good now. But, <laughs> but by the time we got married, she was a vegetarian. Neither of us knew how to cook. Not, neither one of us knew how to cook. And yet, I still expected there to be two to three vegetables, a meat, and bread, and sweet tea on the table. Did I mention that also married a very strong-willed woman? <laughs> My expectations were shattered very quickly. <laughs> Unclear expectations can get us in trouble. Now, it, it could be the assumption of, uh, of what's for dinner, or it could be lack of clarity from a, a supervisor you see, because here's the thing, expectations are usually based on someone's past experience. The, the past behaviors of someone that we're in relationship with usually helps define their ex, our expectations of that person in the present. Or maybe a narrative that has been told to you by a parent or, or someone who had authority over you helped determine what certain expectations you had of yourself, of your life. As you moved into the future. Because expectation shape reality. Here's an example. John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. He had been preaching. He had been baptizing. Out on the outskirts on the edge of the Jordan River. Now Herod. The guy in charge. Didn't like his message. Particularly because it hit really close to home. And so he had John the Baptist locked up. Now while he's in prison. John begins to hear word about Jesus, his cousin, and all of the things that he was doing around the area of Judea. And so he sends word back. And he says, and this is what he says in Matthew 11, verse 3. He says, are you, he sends back some word with his friends. He says, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Now, where did that question come from? Again, they're cousins, they're related the reason that John the Baptist is asking that question is because Jesus is not fitting the bill of the people's expectations of a Messiah. You see, along the countryside and in the back alleys of Jerusalem, people spoke of a Messiah who would come to rescue them from Roman occupation. The word Messiah means Savior. It's the one who redeems. It's the one who comes to rescue so from their perspective, the people of Israel expected a conquering hero. Now fast forward. Fast forward to the last week of the life of Jesus. We find the streets of Jerusalem overflowing. They go from 20,000 population to anywhere from 300 to 400,000 of a population. Pilgrims are flowing into the streets of Jerusalem. Jerusalem to celebrate their annual festival of Passover. Now the story of Passover, you got to understand the context of this. If you don't if you're not familiar with the story, the story of Passover is how the Lord sent Moses to liberate the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. As the story goes, thousands of years ago, the Israelites found themselves enslaved in Egypt. 
Now, according to the book of Exodus, Moses was called by God to go and to tell Pharaoh, you got to what? Let my people go. So he does that. Well, he has a hard time. The first nine trials fail. But the tenth time works. The tenth plague. The tenth plague was that every firstborn man or beast would die. And to protect themselves, the Israelites were told to mark their house with lamb's blood. You mark the the top of your door with lamb's blood, and the angel of death, when he comes through, will pass over your house. The crowd that is arriving in Jerusalem is there for their annual celebration and of remembering that event. They were remembering how God rescued, and and they anticipated that God was about to do it again. Why? Because once again, they found themselves enslaved. And this time, it was Rome. The heavy hand of Roman occupation was felt by all. Roman soldiers were walking the streets, demonstrating power. Order was kept Through subjection, high taxes were demanded of everyone. The weight of being controlled was weighed down on every citizen. And every year, as Passover would roll around, Jewish mothers and fathers would tell their children the story of how their people were slaves in Egypt. But God came and redeemed. And the children would ask, Mama, Daddy, is he going to do it again? Is he going to do it again? The fathers would teach their children prayers, prayers of redemption. Now Pontius Pilate, the guy that Rome put in charge as the governor of Jerusalem and Judea, he knew the story and he knew it very well. And he knew what was on the minds and the hearts of the people during this festival. So every year at Passover, the Roman governor would ride up to Jerusalem from his coastal palace. And the governor would come in all of his imperial majesty to remind the Jews who was really in charge. So if you can imagine, a cavalry of horses would lead this procession of foot soldiers dressed in leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, and golden eagles mounted on top of poles. The sound of marching feet, the clanking of metal, the stomping of horses, and the beating of drums would run and reverberate through the whole city of Jerusalem. And it's also important to understand Roman theology. They had their own theology. Roman belief was that the emperor was not just simply the the ruler of Rome. He was the son of God. So you see, this wasn't just a rival procession. This was a rival statement about God. And and, and this this is the background of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. This is political. This is religious. This is a collision course of worldviews. This event itself will seal the deal for what happens on Good Friday. You can't tolerate a conflicting conflicting worldview. Here's the story. Lyndon read it from us from John this morning. I'm going to read it to you from the Gospel of Mark. The gospel writers, we have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they felt that this story was so important that they all four wanted to make sure that this story was in there. And so every one of them gives us a different angle in which they tell this story. So I want to I encourage you, I'll, I'll mention a little reference to Matthew's perspective in a minute, but I want to encourage you today, if you go home, to read these stories. Read the Palm Sunday stories from all the different perspectives of the gospel writers. But here is Matthew, or here, excuse me, here is Mark's perspective. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples 
And he said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and he will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late... He went out to Bethany with the twelve. If we're not careful, we can let our expectations of what a Savior is to look like keep us from seeing the Savior that God has provided for us. We can let what we think we need from God, keep us from getting what it is actually we need from God. You see, sometimes our traditions can blind us from the new thing that God may be wanting to do in our life. And we can pigeonhole God into a certain way of acting that we miss what God is doing among us. So my challenge to you this morning is don't let, don't let your expectations blind you from seeing the expected one. Don't let what you have come to define as your expectations of a need and a Savior actually blind you from how God is coming to save you today. You see, because here's, here's the thing. A hundred years before Jesus ever rides into Jerusalem... There's a group of people called the Maccabees that will do just the very thing. They would take control of Judea for a short period of time and they would assert Jewish control of the land and they would do that through power. They would do that through military might. And when they arrived into Jerusalem, the crowd would begin to to pull out palm branches and to wave them as they were waving them in victory of what the Maccabees had done. And before the Maccabees, there was King Jehu. And before King Jehu... There was King David. So the people, they had a picture of what the Messiah was going to look like as he rode into Jerusalem. That he would would ride in astride a great war horse leading a vast army. And he would remove all of the foreign powers out of Jerusalem. And he would be crowned king of the Jews. What they wanted and what they thought they needed was a warrior king. And what they got was Jesus. The same crowd that will shout, Hosanna, save us, son of David. Today, in just a few days, will be the same very people that will be crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And why? Because he didn't meet their expectations. I want you to put yourself in that crowd that first Palm Sunday. You hear the sound of of Pilate's military march happening on one side of town. But another side, you see people walking, following a crowd. And it's so easy to follow a crowd, isn't it? You know, I was, uh, a few years ago, I had flew into Frankfurt, Germany, and I had like a six or seven layover, hour layover, and I put my bags in a little, little, little container thing, and I said, you know, I'll see the city, I'll go around, I've never been to Frankfurt, so I'll walk, and all of a sudden, as, as soon as I step out of the airport, there was this huge crowds of people just, just running and walking in the same direction, 
Now, and they were all speaking German, and I didn't speak German. And I'm thinking, wow, you know. And so, so here I am. I'm going to go follow this crowd. So, you know, and it's just, isn't it amazing how we just kind of fit in, and we did, and I did. I fit in, and I just kind of walked with the crowd, and I followed the direction of that crowd, praying to goodness that I wouldn't get lost and wouldn't be able to make my way back to the airport. And so we get there, and, and there, and so this just so happened, it, this was a good time, but it just so happened the Queen of England was standing out on a porch of this big house-looking thing, and she was waving at everybody, doing the whole whole, you know, pageant wave at everybody. Some German artist had painted a picture of her dad, and it was being presented to her. So probably I'd never get a chance to see the Queen of England, and then I had to see the Queen of England in Germany, which is kind of weird. But, but, you know, but it all happened for following the crowd. We so easily follow the crowd. So I just want to Matt, put yourself in the shoes on that first Palm Sunday, and you're following the crowd. You've just been walking with the crowd. You hear the children shouting, Hosanna, son of David. You, the chants become more rhythm. The excitement is building. The, the energy is electrifying. Who could this be? Is it? Is it? Or, or could it be? Is this, is this the Messiah? Is this the one that God is sending to set the people free? People are starting to take off their outer garments and they're laying them on the road like you would do for royalty as royalty passes by. Children are waving palm branches and laying branches onto the road. And, and you, you're getting caught up in the excitement. You, just, you start to take off your outer garment, the one that your great-grandmother made for you. The one that means so much to you. The one that keeps you warm in the winter and the one that, that keeps the beating sun off of you in the summer. That, the thing that, that is so, it's your prized possession. You begin to take it off, and as you begin to lay it down, you catch your first glimpse of this one. He's riding a borrowed donkey instead of a war horse. And his procession, did you notice his procession? They're made up of prostitutes and panhandlers, the sick and the outcast, the fishermen and tax collectors, vagabonds. Where are the soldiers? Where are the swords? Where's the power? And to make matters worse, he rides right past Pilate's headquarters to the temple. No overthrow of power, but overthrow of the temple. And his ride, it takes him straight through the city to a hill called Calvary where he would die a criminal's death. The story in Matthew ends this way. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, Who is this? Because you see, when you're shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us, son of David, the warrior king, you expect to see a warrior riding a stallion, not a street preacher on a donkey. Even if the prophets, even if the prophets foretold, lo, your king will come to you, triumphant and victorious, Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And, you know, here's the thing. It's amazing. It's amazing how our expectations can blind us even from the word of God. See, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we can let our expectations of a Savior keep us from seeing God's redemption. Because when we assume that Jesus will act a certain way or hang out with certain people, then we can be certain that we have missed God's liberation. When we assume that Jesus would vote a certain way, then we can be certain that we have missed his message. And our Sunday morning worship can turn empty when we expect Jesus to act a certain way on Monday. And we all do it. Preachers are the worst at it. I mean, we live in this world. And, and we can make, we, we, so we start defining what those expectations will be. This is the way God will act. This is the way you can expect God to act. So we're going to run the church this way. 
if we could only just keep him behind the tomb. But we'll find that story next week. You know, you know what? It's kind of like we're all like Cal in Talladega Nights, aren't we? Like this. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo T-shirt because it says, like, I want to be formal, right. but I'm here to party, too. Because I like to party, so I like my Jesus to party. I like to picture Jesus as a ninja fighting off evil samurai. I can't show you the rest of that. <laughs> But we do, it don't. I mean, we all have these certain definitions. But let me tell you something. Let me just give you a teaser of what happens seven days from now. He doesn't stay behind the tomb. He doesn't stay behind our expectations. God loves to mess up God's people. So I want to encourage you to take some time this week and examine how have you made God in your own image. I want you to... To, to, to explore how you have placed certain expectations on God. One of my favorite Anne Lamott quotes, Anne Lamott is, a, is an author, she says, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you hate. Don't you love that? Some of us are missing out on what God has for us. Because we're holding on too tightly to our expectations of how God should act in our life. We're we're missing out on what God wants to do through us and in us and for us because we're letting our expectations of God dictate what happens in us. So here's what I want you to do. And I want those palms to serve as your expectations. I want you this morning... Just to lay down those expectations as you head into Holy Week. And I want you to let that donkey walk all over him this morning. We actually had a donkey coming, but he got muddy, so we couldn't come. I I want you to be open to God doing a new thing in your life. I I want you to be open to the possibility to God's plans being greater than what you could ever anticipate in your life. I want you to lay down your expectations and let that donkey just walk right over them this morning. That's how I want you to head into Holy Week. So what false expectations have ruined relationships for you? What expectations do you need to lay down? What possessions have possessed you that you need to be released from? What sins do you need to lay down? What habit do you need to surrender? What assumptions do you need to let go of? Because if we're going to find salvation today, then we need to let go of the expectations of a Savior and trust God with our life. Because here's the thing. There are two parades going on in our world today. There's one of force and greed, and there's the other one of humility and service. There's one that is being controlled by power, and there is the other one that is being led by love. There's two parades happening in our world today. One that glamorizes military might and violence, and the other that shows the way of nonviolence and the love of enemies. Two parades. One that marches through the streets to demonstrate power and exclusion, And one that marches with the young and the vulnerable and the courageous. There's the pilots of this world. And there's Jesus and his church. Two arrivals. Two processions. Which one will you follow? Which parade will you join? It really depends on what are your expectations of a Savior. The way of Jesus is the way of love and humility, service, grace, mercy, compassion. It's the way of radical forgiveness. And if you can see your Savior in those terms, then go ahead and wave your palm branches and go ahead and shout, Hosanna, Son of David. Because your king has come.
Let us pray. Gracious God, today we stand at a crossroads. We have two parades going on before us. We pray for courage. We pray for the gift of faith. We pray for the guidance of your Holy Spirit to lead us to the way of Jesus. The way of love and grace and mercy. In Jesus' name.